Welcome to lesson 11, where we will continue learning about ocean waves. So in this lesson we'll talk about how waves form, what creates a wave, and then some of the things that happen over the, the life of the wave, how they disperse and interfere with one another, and we'll wrap up by talking about tides. Okay, so how do waves form? Well, there are different types of waves in the ocean and all of these types of waves have some kind of a disturbing force. So a wave is nothing more than a mechanism to transfer energy and that energy has to come from somewhere. So this table is in order of increasing wavelengths starting with very small capillary waves with wavelengths on the order of one centimeter all the way up to tides which have a wavelength of half the Earth's circumference. And tsunamis are also very large uh, sesh is something that happens in in certain geographic areas. If you have an, a basin, you can set up this sesh type of wave. We're not going to talk much about that, but where we are going to focus our discussions is on wind waves. The vast majority of waves in the ocean are wind generated, and that's where we're going to focus. So, so what happens when wind blows across the surface of the ocean? Well, you uh, essentially you get friction between the wind and the surface of the water. It starts to push along some of those water molecules and creates uh, waves and eventually uh, those waves become bigger and you start out with small ripples on the surface. I'm sure we've all seen uh, things that look like this. If you have a still still pond or a still lake, a lot of times you can see these ripples. So <clears throat> essentially it's an energy transfer. The wind is transferring energy into the water, kinetic energy, and then the water molecules start to move. <clears throat> and then as those waves grow, so moving from the left to the right here, we start out as capillary waves, and as the wind continues to add energy into the water, those waves grow, become bigger, and the wavelength grows as well. And once they exceed 1.74 centimeters, they're no longer called capillary waves, they're called gravity waves, and they continue to grow and get longer and again, here's that steepness ratio that we learned about in lesson 10. So if they approach this steepness ratio of one to seven, then they're in danger of breaking or forming white caps. This is a nice flow chart that, that describes the, the life cycle of a wave. So uh, as we just said, the waves start with uh, wind blowing across the surface, creates these high frequency, very low wavelength waves and also very low wave height. And then as long as the, this is an energy balance uh, discussion here. So as long as the wind energy that is flowing into the system is greater than the wave energy dissipation, which is the loss of energy, if the if the energy in is greater than the energy out, then this then the waves will grow. So you're adding energy to your system. At some point, you'll reach a steady state when the the wind energy is exactly equal to the wave energy dissipation. So so you're not adding or losing energy from your ocean system. And those are called fully developed seas. And then at some point, the wind will die down. So the wind energy is now less than the wave energy dissipation so that you're overall losing energy from your system and that's called reducing seas and then uh, swell is something we'll talk about later on but swell is is low frequency long wavelength waves which happen after the wind has stopped completely but you still have this wave energy which is uh, being transmitted and I should mention this wave energy dissipation comes primarily through mechanisms like friction. So anytime we know that uh, anytime in nature when when objects are moving next to each other, rubbing against each other, even water molecules, you have some friction and that's an energy dissipation mechanism. You also have energy dissipated in the bottom if, if the water's shallow enough or anytime you hit a solid structure like a breakwater or a piling or anything like that and it causes wave energy dissipation. There are 
three main factors that affect the development of wind waves and they are the wind speed, the wind duration, and the fetch. So it should hopefully make sense to you that the, the faster the wind speed is, the higher the winds, the, the larger the waves will become and uh, the faster they will develop so because you have more energy transferring into the water in a shorter amount of time. Wind duration is important because uh, the winds have to blow for a long period of time before you reach that fully developed seas condition because it takes time for waves to develop and this is typically on the order of, of several hours or many hours and then fetch is the the geographic distance or the length over which the wind can blow so if you have a an open ocean unlimited fetch kind of a situation you're going to get much bigger waves than you would in a in a sheltered area something like the Chesapeake Bay or the Severn River so wind duration fetch and wind speed are the key characteristics that determine how large your seas will become and how long it takes to reach that fully developed situation so if you see a picture like this in the ocean what's going on here um, you're getting white caps and if you recall from lesson 10 that this happens when we exceed the wave height to wavelength ratio of 1 to 7 the waves become extremely steep and you can kind of see that right here this wave looks like a very steep wave and when that happens the wind blows the tip of the, the waves off and that's what becomes the white water the white caps that you see so these are steep waves what does a boat wake look like so we talked about dispersion and how waves of different wavelengths travel at different speeds and you can see that very nicely in a boat wake so watch this video it's a boat driving down a canal and you'll see the the wake is another source or, or going back to the generation of waves boat wakes are another form of waves that where the energy is coming from the boat and is being transmitted into the water and what you'll see is is waves of different frequencies are created and they travel out perpendicular to the direction of the boat and the fast or the longer waves will travel faster and will disperse so so you'll see snapshots of long waves uh, moving ahead of shorter waves so it's a nice picture of the dispersion nature of water waves but remember in shallow water there is no dispersion all waves travel at the same speed in a given depth of shallow water okay this is a picture of some uh, mature wind waves off the Oregon coast so these are uh, long wavelength mature fully developed seas and you can see the nice straight uniform uh, wave heights here it's not uh, choppy uh, chaotic seas that you would see in other times what's the difference between seas and swell those are terms that we throw around a lot without really fully determining or defining and understanding what we mean so these pictures are, are excellent descriptions of these two two cases so seas when we talk about seas we're talking about the the wind is actively blowing in this area and is creating these waves you see a lot of white caps and you see chaos you see waves coming from all different directions there's all different wavelengths and frequencies and wave heights happening here and it's all commingled together in the same area compare that to swell where you see these nice orderly uh, long wave crest parallel waves um, all traveling in the same direction <clears throat> and the difference is that swell is what happens away from the area of wind so the waves get generated where it's windy but then those waves are going to travel away from that region so if you if you happen to be in an area where the wind has stopped but the waves are still traveling that's when you're going to see swell when waves 
are interacting like in this in the previous uh, picture of the seas when I said you have different wavelengths and different frequencies interacting they will interfere with one another and that interference can either be destructive or constructive destructive is when the two waves uh, basically cancel each other out and constructive is when they add to one another to make larger waves and you've probably all heard the term rogue waves that's a, a thing that occurs it's it's the basically the ultimate in constructive interference it's the, the perfect storm of, of everything comes together to give you a freakishly high wave so mathematically you can you can describe this by uh, overlaying two slightly different waves on one another so the the red and the blue waves here represent waves with slightly different wavelengths and but they're operating at the same time and in the same location so go back to that that picture in your mind of the of the seas you've got all these wavelengths and frequencies happening in the same area at the same time so the the waves will add to one another to create an overall surface of the of the water that looks something like this green picture and at the areas like point number one here where the blue and the red waves are peaking at the same time that is constructive interference so that the so that the total looks extremely large contract that contrast that with point number two where the blue and the red waves are out of phase the, the one is peaking while the other one is at a trough so the the sum of those is going to be near zero that would be an example of destructive interference so you get a very low overall uh, total sea state at that point so this is a, an example of, or a picture of constructive interference versus destructive interference and a great example of destructive interference is noise canceling headphones that's what they strive to do with sound waves is to cancel out the the noise by actively creating a, a wave that's exactly opposite of the sound here's another this is an actual uh, trace of a sea state sea surface elevation versus time and when you see a, a huge spike like this which is abnormal from the rest of the trace that's a that's a rogue wave and that actually happens once in a while at sea so here's again some videos you can watch about rogue waves all right and finally we'll wrap up with a discussion about tides so you probably or you know something about tides from your navigation and seamanship classes we know that tides are created by gravitational interaction between the earth moon and sun and also the centrifugal force of the earth as it spins so the water the, in the oceans tends to uh, be affected by the centrifugal force as the earth spins <clears throat> there are three main categories of tides diurnal means you have one high and one low per day and the the cycle is slightly longer than 24 hours so it's 24 hours and 50 minutes and the other type of tides is semi-diurnal where you have two highs and two lows every day and then the cycle is exactly half of the the diurnal so it's 12 hours and 25 minutes and then the third category is called mixed diurnal where you have two highs and two lows but the heights of those two highs will vary significantly whereas in a, a semi-diurnal your two high tides every day will be roughly the same height and your two lows will be the same so what this means is you know, every 12 hours in 25 minutes in a semi-diurnal cycle you will have a high tide every 12 hours and 25 minutes you'll have a low tide <clears throat> and the tide levels in a specific location are affected by these factors here so as you know the the tide levels the difference between a high and a low vary 
a lot depending on where you are here in Annapolis at the Chesapeake Bay Severn River we have very low tidal range usually about one or two feet if that whereas other parts of the world can have uh, huge tide ranges of 30 or 40 or 50 feet difference between a high and a low tide this is a, a nice map of the world showing where these different types of tides occur. So the east coast of the United States and Annapolis area is primarily semi-diurnal. That's true of almost the entire Atlantic basin. So if you look at the, the Atlantic coast of South America, the Atlantic coast of Africa, those are all semi-diurnal. The Atlantic coast of Europe, it's all semi-diurnal types of tides. Uh, the Gulf Coast of the United States is a diurnal tide, so you only get one high, one low per day there. And then the West Coast of the U.S. is a mixed tide region where you'll get two highs and two lows, but the, the heights of those highs varies significantly, as you see here in this picture. probably hopefully remember from NAV uh, there's a difference between s the tide range changes during um, a cycle a lunar cycle and at some point in the lunar cycle when we have full moons and new moons the tides are higher than usual we call those spring tides and that happens because the moon and the sun are in line with one another so that their gravitational effects are adding constructively. So you get uh, added gravitational pull and the tides are larger than normal. Those are called spring tides. And then during the first quarter, third quarter moon, the, the moon and the sun are at 90 degree angles and the gravitational effects counter one another and you get lower than normal tides and those are called neap tides. So spring tides are the largest and neap tides are the smallest that occur. Tidal range, of course, difference between the high and low. Tidal bores, this is an interesting phenomenon that occurs in some inlet type areas. It creates a, a wave that lasts for a long time. People like to surf them. So you can find all kinds of cool videos online of uh, tidal bores in different areas. A lot of times they happen in, in narrow, long, narrow inlets like, like fjords in Norway and places like that. And then some definitions. Flood current, of course, is when the tide is coming in. Ebb current is when the tide goes out. Slack water is the period between high and low when the tide, when the current changes from a flood to an ebb. And finally, here's some pictures of the Bay of Fundy. The Bay of Fundy has some of the highest recorded tides in the world. It's located in Nova Scotia. And generally, the further away from the equator you get, the tidal range increases. So uh, Nova Scotia is fairly far north. So you get some huge tide swings. And I had a personal experience here a long time ago on a submarine. We, we moored to a pier in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and we did not properly account for this huge tidal swing. And we dropped our brow into the water when the, when the tide went down, kind of like you see in this picture here. The submarine went down and the brow suddenly became too short to reach the pier and it fell in the water. So that's an example of being stupid and not properly accounting for the huge tidal swing that happens in that area. And that's it for lesson 11. So we talked about uh, what creates waves. So you should understand the, the process of wind generation, or sorry, wave generation from wind. What affects the size of the waves. That was the wind speed, the wind duration, and the fetch. Uh, a little bit about constructive and destructive interference, and then tides. So that's it. Thank you.